I want to thank you so much for being with us this evening to celebrate a very special new book, Northern Light, Power Land, and the Memory of Water by Kazim Ali. My name is Megan Bachmeyer, and I serve as the Vice President of Advancement and Chief Administrative Officer at Milkweed Editions. And a couple of items before I introduce Kazim and our publisher, Daniel Slager. First, if you have questions for Kazim or Daniel, please drop them in the chat anytime, and they will address as many as they are able to get to. And then just a brief note on Milkweed Editions for those of you who are new to our work. This year, we celebrate the 40th anniversary of the press. We are a nonprofit organization and our mission is to identify, nurture and publish transformative literature and build an engaged community around it. And our business model is based on philanthropy. Unlike commercial publishers whose work is driven by profit motives, we acquire manuscripts based on artistic excellence and transformative potential. Um, that those works have for readers. And so I wanna just say a thank you to our donors who make what we do possible. And a special thank you to our editor circle members for your loyal annual support. And then lastly, uh, a group of directors, some of whom are here tonight, gave special gifts to Milkweed in honor of Cosm's book. And I wanna acknowledge their generosity as well. And as we mark 40 years, the principles which animated the founding of the press remain core to our work today. Literature fosters critical empathy and appreciation for difference. It introduces us to new ideas and influences the way we move through the world. And the role Milkweed can play in our world has been on all of our minds here in our home community of Minneapolis. As we observe the trial um, of uh, surrounding George Floyd and grieve the death of another black man in an encounter with the police just this past weekend. And we are additionally mindful of the fact that Milkweed is based on the traditional homeland of the Dakota people. Residing here since time immemorial, Dakota people still call Minnesota Makoche home with four federally recognized Dakota nations and many more Dakota people residing in what is now the state of Minnesota. And due to continued legacies of colonization, genocide and forced removal, generations of Dakota people remain disenfranchised from their traditional homeland. Presently, Minnesota Makoche has become a refuge and home for many indigenous nations and peoples, including seven federally recognized Ojibwe nations. And this land statement, which I just read, now appears in every book we publish. And I wanna thank Milkweed Fellow Kachina Yeager, who's an enrolled member of the Dakota Nation from Tinta Winta, Prairie Island, for her work creating it. And we humbly encourage all of our readers to reflect upon the historical legacies held in the lands that we now occupy. And it felt particularly appropriate to read this in introducing this evening's event, because I want to thank Kazim for his beautiful, important book, which addresses the complicated relationship that we have with the land and with each other. And with that, I will introduce our featured speakers, uh, Kazim and Daniel. You two can go ahead and take yourselves off of mute and join me. Uh, Daniel is Milkweed's publisher and CEO, and he relocated from the New York publishing scene over 15 years ago now, and at the helm of Milkweed, he has led the press to impressive heights. Just this past year, Milkweed reached over 1.5 million readers with our books and saw two books land on the New York Times bestsellers list. Daniel acquires and edits most of the books for Milkweed, and I know collaborating with writers is the part of his work that brings him the most joy. Daniel, thank you for your leadership and dedication to the mission of Milkweed and the writers and readers we serve. And Kazim Ali is the award-winning author of several volumes of poetry, novels, essay collections, and cross-genre texts. He is also an accomplished translator and the editor of several anthologies and books of criticism. Kazim is currently a professor of literature and writing at the University of California, San Diego, and we are absolutely delighted and honored to be publishing his latest book, Northern Light, Power Land, and the Memory of Water. Kazim, thank you for your work and for being with us this evening, and I will let you two take it from here. Thanks very much, Megan. I really appreciate it. Kazim, thanks so much for making time for us. Oh, it's great to be here. I'm so excited to chat with you. Good, good. This, is, um, this has been a long time coming from my perspective, this conversation. <laughs> I, I mean, obviously, we've been working together for a while now, but typically, around the time of publication of a book like yours, we'd have you out here to the Twin Cities. Yeah. We have a chance to get dinner. We talk about the whole process and uh, the impact of the book and the reception of the book, which has been really, really terrific so far. I hope you found it gratifying. Uh, it's been it's been really, really great. I've been here, I think because of the social media world, I've been hearing 
you know, people just reaching out and sharing their stories and people who grew up actually in Northern Manitoba with me have also been popping up and reaching out after, you know, four decades. So that's been really <laughs> intense too. That's amazing. And like, and like me, most, you know, people were like, we had no idea. We had no idea. We were all children together. So what did we know? But, you know, so that's been a whole other, a whole other thing. I would imagine that's, that's really wild and cool and amazing. Um, I, you know, I think it's safe to assume that there will be attendees this evening who've read the book, um, who will have some questions. I hope you all will and drop them in the chat. Um, I'll kind of moderate the chat and integrate your, your questions into mine as we go. I have plenty to talk about if questions don't arise because um, I love this book and it's been a joy working with you um, to develop it and publish it. And I'm really happy for you and proud of the book and um, convinced it's going to do some really important work in the world. Um, so the first thing I'd like to ask you on the assumption that not everyone with us will have read the book is, um, you know, you, as Megan alluded to, you've authored some 15 or so books, uh, collections of poems, collections of essays, translations, um, nothing really like this book. Where, where did this book come from? No, I mean, um, I was, so I grew up in Northern Manitoba in this tiny little town of, you know, I don't even know when I was a child, I thought a hundred people lived there. You know, it was so small. It's probably more like a thousand to 1500 people in the middle of the forest, you know, a little clearing in the middle of the forest with these huge tall trees and nothing in any direction for miles. I mean, when we were kids later, a couple of years after that, when we were kids and we would watch Little House on the Prairie, that's the closest I could think of that, that, that it felt like to grow up in the town to the, the town that I grew up in. And I always thought about it very nostalgically in terms of the games that we played and the things that I learned there. That's actually when, so we moved there when I was about three um, or four, I don't remember exactly. But that is where I started kindergarten. That's where I um, learned how to read and write. And that's where most of my early, I have a very, very few memories that don't start there. I have some memories from earlier when we lived in Winnipeg. Manitoba. So it was always an origin point for me. But um, when I started to research, you know, I wanted to, for another book project completely, I was thinking about um, migration and border crossing. Those are things that have always interested me. And I was thinking about our, our international life, the international life of my family um, as migrants and, and nomads of a sort. And so I began to research and this would have been 2016-ish, I think. And I discovered that the dam, we grew up there because my dad was an engineer on this hydroelectric dam. And I learned that I wanted to know, is the dam still operational? Is the town still there? Whatever happened? And what I discovered was the dam was still operational and that the local First Nations community um, called the Cross Lake First Nation in English, the Cree word is Pimichikamak, um, that they had a long history to going decades back of litigating and organizing against the province and the federal government, which had not fulfilled the conditions of the treaty under which the dam was built. And that there had been a lot of environmental damage and devastation in the region. And then there had just been a suicide epidemic amongst the young people. This is tragically not uncommon in Northern First Nations communities, the suicide rate among young people is much, much higher than the Canadian national average. And so Cross Lake had just been afflicted with that the previous winter. And so I knew it was kind of like a sense of mission. Um, I didn't know what I was gonna do, but I felt like uh, I had not planned to go. This is in the book, I talk about this. I thought I was just gonna research and learn as much as I could. And then I actually wrote out of the blue I used to be a political organizer. And so maybe there's a level of chutzpah, but I wrote to the chief. <laughs> I couldn't think of anyone else to write to. I wrote to the chief and I said, I grew up in Genpeg. My dad was one of the engineers who worked on the dam. You know, what is going on? And she wrote me back. She didn't answer. I sent her this list of questions. 
She didn't answer my question. She wrote me back this one line email saying, uh, essentially, I, I quote in the book, but she says, uh, you know, come up and we'll show you. We'll, we'll, you know, come here and we'll answer your questions. And just the thought of doing that, I mean, getting on a plane, flying to Winnipeg, getting on a prop plane, flying on the six seater out into the woods, you know, at the time that I grew up there, it was a fly in only community. There were no roads that went there. And uh, that's changed. But uh, it was ludicrous, the idea. I mean, I just thought like, what, am I a journalist? Am I like a, you know, crocodile dendy or something? Like, I, you know, I can't, I'm teaching, I have a court, I'm teaching classes at Oberlin. Like this, this is, nothing makes sense about this, you know? Um, but it just drew me and it just became, uh, I talk about this in the earlier chapters of the book, like what I went through in my brain and, and I went back, I went back and I did not know what I was going to write when I went back. I had no idea. Um, I had contacted, there's a Canadian uh, poet that I know named Carmine Starnino. I've known him for years and years, but he became editor, he's in magazine editing and he became, an, he became editor of the Walrus, which is a big Canadian newspaper, like news and culture and politics, that kind of thing. And I said, what do you think? Could I write something? Does this sound interesting? And he was like, oh yeah, that definitely sounds interesting. You know, how about 4,000 words or something? Well, I transcribed, I went up there, I went, you know, everything that happened. I transcribed my notes when I came back and it was like seven or 8,000 words. And he said, wow, that's long. And it's also, it's just your diary. Like, can you try to shape it into something? Can you actually make a piece out of it, you know? So I worked on it that fall and, um, but what happened was it just got longer um, and it kept getting longer and longer. And what I ended up with was about 21 or 22,000 words. That's what you saw mm -hmm. in the end, but it was very focused in the beginning. I wanna say this part um, and then I will stop talking, but you, you might have more questions. But um, in the beginning, I felt at the very beginning, I wanted to write about my own childhood. When I went up there, I realized that is not the story here. The story is the dam, the story is the Cross Lake First Nation, the story is the story of their resistance to the impacts of colonialism and all of that. But what you actually helped me see, and then what we worked on from there was, I am part of the story, I was part of the story. The collision between this South Asian immigrant family, you know, trying to make it in Canada, in the new nation, on the opposite side of this dam from the indigenous people upon whose land it was actually built with this big mother load, like the gorilla in the room, which is like the nation of Canada. And both of us on either side, like we want in, they don't want in, they want their land back, but that, 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 that what sits between the immigrant and the indigenous. And so that the story of my family was actually essential to understanding the story of the indigenous community. And so we went from there and we built, we built what is what this book is now, which is, as you say, not like anything else I've done so far. That's, that's so interesting. Some of that I knew, but it's great to hear you articulate it. <laughs> um, in a narrative of books, books beginnings. Um, I guess I, I want to sprinkle in some questions about our working relationship and um, kind of milkweed's place from your perspective in the world. And so one question I wanna ask, and this is a convenient place to ask it is, um, why did you come to me? I mean, I know I had, I, I could tell I you why I was interested in your work, but I had admired your work for years, as you know, I think we had corresponded years ago on another subject altogether, but why did you come to me? Why did you think milkweed would be a good one? Um, so I've loved milkweed for a long time. As you say, uh, earlier on, I had done a book on, uh, uh, Ramadan on fasting for Ramadan, which Ramadan starts tonight, by the way. Um, and I'd thought of milkweed because I think in the tradition of like, um, you know, there are very few presses like this, but beacon presses may be another, um, but there, that there is an ethic of the humanist and that there is an ethic of um, like the sustainable future, um, that books have a role beyond uh, like entertainment or beyond uh, uh, like art for art's sake, but that there's a real, there's like a mission in the publishing. Um, I'd always loved that about Milkweed's books, the Credo series, that's the old school uh, environmental writing series where those are regulars on my bookshelves, you know, um, Patty Ann Rogers' work and um, 
I forget who the other one, oh, Gary Paul Nabhan has a book in that series. You know, those, those books were really important. And so I thought like, and then, so I said, I had sent the fasting book. And at the time it was sort of like, your nonfiction list was not as, you know, the place of like a spiritual book on that list maybe didn't appeal at the time. I, I forgive you, but I published it with someone else. But when it came time to do this book, I felt that I, I don't know. I thought Milkweed was like the place I would start. I thought that's, you know, I'd, I'd actually sent it to the previous publisher and they said, oh yeah, this looks really interesting. Let's think about it. And I thought, I don't know. I think what it was, was I felt that for the people of Cross Lake, for the story of this dam, I needed to get it out to as many people as I could. Like I could not settle in any way. And it's, I think it's easier to settle for oneself but when one realizes this story is so important and it has got to get out there. And that's when I started to make this list. I thought like, okay, who's, who's gonna be able to do this book? Who would do it and who should do it? Remembering that at the time it was only focused on the dam. It didn't have all that, you know, we added almost 50 pages at the beginning about like my family and coming, all of that stuff. None of it was there. It started at like, what is now, I think chapter four, five of this book no what is now uh chapter four of this book is where the what you originally saw was where it started and so I was making a list and you were on the first you were on the top of the list and this is the fun part of the story so I was you know email plus I'm impulsive plus you and I had stayed in tentative like sporadic touch through the years we'd every once in a while I'd write an email to you and you would send an email back or what what have you um, so I just wrote to Daniel out of the blue to every, everybody. I wrote to him, uh, I just said, Hey, I, I'm working on this book. Do you want to look at it? And Daniel wrote back in, I can show you this timestamp. Daniel wrote back in six minutes <laughs> and said, yes, yeah, send it. And I sent it. I sent it right away. Cause that's how I roll. And a week, seven days later, he wrote back and said, okay, yes, we're going to take this but I, I want you to work on it and we'll talk about that. Um, but for now I'm taking it and we'll, uh, I will be back in touch with you and we'll talk about it. And so that was the fastest success. That was the fastest <laughs> agreement to look at a manuscript response to a query I've ever gotten. And it's also the fast, probably the fastest acceptance I've gotten. Then it took some weeks before we chatted because I was going off to Breadloaf to teach and you were doing, you had other things going on. And then we chatted and you said, okay, the book, oh, I love this book, I wanna do it, but there's an important part of the story that's not here, which is that, you know, the part about the, the family and all of that. And so then we actually had a whole editorial process. I don't know if anyone, I don't wanna bore everyone with that, but then I, I, so I worked on the book for like a good, from that moment, I think that happened in the spring of 18, right? Mm -hmm. ish and then it wasn't until uh like the summer of 19 that I finished and handed in the new version to you so it took a, a long time of like going back and forth and working on it and developing it and one of the reasons was this book has three um, uh four this book has four main aspects it does have a memoir quality because it's about my family and it includes this meta commentary text of like me going up there and my the role that I'm playing and my nervousness and uh, you know confronting these people who were damp had so harmed by the work that my father did that there's a little strand of that in their memoir strand there is also an an essayistic kind of strand around like a reflection on the concept of home and the concepts of belonging and indigeneity and migration like a little more like that then there are very much journalistic sections where I have to talk about the politics and I have to talk about the dam itself. There's a reportage aspect. And finally, when this came in really late, there's historical writing because it wasn't enough to talk about the dam. I had to talk about 
the history of colonization in Canada and I had to talk about the Indian Act and I had to talk about the treaties, um, the numbered treaties from the late 1800s. And I had to talk about the history of how the English colonized Canada, which is like in a particular way, you know? So, um, so it's a weird kind of hybrid book when I read from it at readings. And I always have to warn people at the beginning, like, okay, there's a lot, there's a lot of different modes that happen in this book. So, you know, and they, and it sort of kaleidoscopes through um, all of the modes at all times. It's not like there's a big background chapter at the beginning and then I launch into the personal, you know, it's more like an ongoingness. And I think that developed through a lot of careful attention from various um, editors um, along the way, Daniel, of course, and then Jim Schley came in as an outside editor. Then we, the Canadian publisher had an editorial process. So it's kind of like a lot of hands came together to support the writing of this book. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's, I really appreciate the fulsome response. Um, and I'm also so, it's so nice to hear you describe these elements, but also that you now feel good about um, having sort of discovered your own personal ownership of the story. And because I think that's a really important element. And I also think that the, one of the things I really love about the book is that this place that's so fraught with history, family history, personal history, and history, history, history of the Pemichicamac people there and of Canadian colonization of the, of the land. It's also the place where I would argue you discovered your poetic sensibility, um, looking at the night sky and you, you mentioned um, discovering your imagination and the nostalgia you have for the place. Um, really comes across beautifully in the book. And I think the book is so much richer for all that. Um, there, you know, any number of journalists could have written a history of the place. Yeah. Um, and it's a complicated history. So I don't mean to diminish that element of the book. I think that took new chops, developing new chops for you, did it not? It did. It really did. And it actually helped me. Um, I have wanted to write about, I actually have, I shouldn't say that I haven't, but um, in this is a little bit of a digression, but important. Um, for about five years or six years, I was traveling back in the summers and in the winters to Ramallah in the West Bank, in Palestinian West Bank. And I was teaching at a yoga studio there. And I was also training yoga teachers. And I kept a journal the whole time. I have written about it. I transcribed the journals. I put it all together, but it it, I never, I've never been able to face making it a book, you know, I couldn't figure out like how it all fit together. And it's very, very diffuse and scattered. It's close to the first draft that you saw of this one where it's more like personal reflections and all of that. And the active process of getting, of making this has really helped me to think, oh yes, I can definitely go back and do the other. And, but it's an opposite challenge because in the case of this one, I started with a diary transcription of about 7,000 words. Um, the, the case with the yoga writings is quite the opposite. I have about 100,000 <laughs> words of diary <laughs> over the course of however many years it was. And so it's more of a, you know, it'll be a lot of shaping. And then the other thing that I really learned how to do in this book was the research. Mm -hmm. um, and, and not only the research, doing the research, because although I teach in a university, I'm not a trained, uh, uh, you know, I'm teach I teach in creative writing. And so I did not train in a, in a doctoral program where I learned like research methodologies and all of that kind of stuff. So I actually had to learn, okay, there's three things I had to learn. I had to learn how to ask the questions and do the research in the first place. I also had to learn what are the ethical practices for working with indigenous communities and conducting research in and on, on quote, indigenous communities. And then finally, and that's a whole other ball of wax. And then finally, I had to learn how do you incorporate this as a writer? How do you incorporate all of this info into the book and make it still make it compelling and readable and interesting, especially when, as I said, there are also memoir components in the same book where it's not just a piece of scholarship, right? So that kind of training in those three areas on this book, which was a very focused project, it was one single week, 
as opposed to that other experience, which was many years of going back and all of this writing material. And I drugged out, I did transcribe it. I drugged it out because I thought there would be a chance to show it to you. But this is the stack of, tra of the transcripts from that. It's, it's 400 pages. <laughs> so I feel equipped. I've already, to everyone who's on the call, I've already told Daniel about this book. He knows it exists. And I feel equipped to work on it. Now I can feel like, I've, I've trained myself to be able to do it. You anticipated one of my questions, which was, what are you working on now? And What's what next? On? Yeah, I'm working on two projects and they're, they couldn't be further apart or maybe you'll think they're, they're common. Uh, there's some common thread, but I, this is my plan. This summer, once classes end, um, uh, so listen, I've just been elected chair of my department here and not the creative writing department, but the entire like literature, compare, it's a comparative literature and cultural <laughs> studies department, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's gonna be my life from now on. But uh, so beginning in June, once classes are over, this is my project for the summer. This is my writing project right here. The other major ongoing project that I'm working on is I'm now, I've decided, you know, after I moved to California, after I finished this project, I've decided that I wanna give myself permission to do whatever makes me happy, whatever pleases me. <laughs> I have tenure now. I have published a bunch of poetry books. I don't owe anything to anybody. I have nothing left to prove. And so I am writing a, uh, I've in, in de I'm developed and am writing a, a young adult fantasy trilogy for Choose Your Own Adventure. So it'll be interactive, uh, a Choose Your Own Adventure fantasy. The book one in the trilogy is coming out in September and eventually probably uh, later on this calendar year, I have to start working on the second uh, book. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> That's so fantastic. I, I yeah. love how you continue pushing boundaries. Uh, I just, you know, I've always loved children's literature. I still read it as a grown person, as many people do. I read YA. I love fantasy so much. And so I thought, I can do whatever I like now. <laughs> Fabulous. Yeah. So um, if I could turn your attention back to Cross Lake, mm -hmm. um, you, you, one of the things I was very struck, so I, I paged through a little more quickly than I would like, but I paged through the book again over the last couple of days just to sort of gather my thoughts for our conversation this evening. And yeah, it's so, it's, it's so well done. It was really gratifying, actually, to look back through it. Um, one of the things I was really struck by on this reading is um, your almost, well, I was going to say singular ability. I don't know, that might be, you know, that might be a little exaggerated, but your very unique ability to connect with people in that place and to establish relationships of trust um, such that you, because a big part of the book is you, you listening and you receiving stories. And uh, it's one thing to do research um, in the library, as you were alluding to, it's another thing to go and ask people what's happened in their community, to share their stories with you. It starts in a sweat lodge, and then it goes on from there. Is this something that you, you are capable of broadly in life? Was it especially apt in this case? I mean, I mean how is that possible? I, I learned on the ground in that case. Um, I knew, I felt, so this, I guess this is related to who was I? in that town. What was I doing there? Um, I did say I'm a writer. That's what I said. Some people naturally assumed I was a journalist. Mm -hmm. Some people didn't know who I was, but, and I was there at the invitation of the government. The chief invited me and um, Leroy Muswagen, who invited me for the sweat lodge was on the governing council. There were other people who knew I was in town. It took me a little while to, um, get bold about the fact that I could ask for access, mm -hmm. that I could ask people to talk to me, that I could explain who I was. Mm -hmm. um, and that happens in the book where I'm sitting in front of the band office and I'm looking around and mm -hmm. the man, one of the men comes down and sits down at the, there's these little picnic tables. And so he came and sat down at the picnic table where I was sitting and he was, it was for his smoke break. Mm -hmm. And I just think like to myself, like, okay, well, if I was a journalist, I would just, tell him who I was and start asking him questions. And so that's what I did. I said, hi, I'm, you know, I'm Cosm, I'm a writer, I've come to the community, can I ask you some questions? And he was like, sure, you know, and we started talking. But um, earlier in the book, I think 
you know, before I had that level of boldness, um, I just felt like I was in the presence of people who I was grateful that they wanted to talk to me. We were upfront and we always told everybody, whoever we were talking to, we meaning the guy that I was driving me around and, and me, that my dad was one of the people that built the dam, that, that you know, that I'm back, that I want to know what happened. So everybody knew that from the get go. It was never like I'm some stranger, you know, although this is a community that is in Palestine is the same. This is a community that is, they're used to people coming in from the outside, from the social justice piece, you know? And so there's a level of gratitude in terms of, yes, we are glad that people from the outside world are coming and that are aware of what's happening here. And there's a level of cynicism, mm -hmm. which is like, oh, well, you guys are just gonna come and like pose with the poor, mm -hmm. you know, people. And then you're gonna go back to wherever you came from, you know? And so that was also there. Um, it was not, it never blocked, I don't think, if it did, I didn't hear about it, but it never blocked people's response to me. But I was really conscious about that myself. I was thinking like, what am I doing here? You know, what am I gonna be able to do for these people? You know, Jackson Osborne, who is one of the elders who features in the book the most actually, and he's on the cover. He's, he's the one who's holding up his photograph on the cover. Um, he was really open with me, you know? He was so glad I came. He was kept saying like, thank God you came. This is amazing. God's, he would say, God sent you to us. You know, like he was so, and I was nervous because I felt like, oh my God, what does he expect me to do? Like, I, this is not a good, this is not good. You know, like, is he going to expect, you know, I, I just didn't know. And I didn't know what this was going to happen in the end anyways. So there was that, but there was also, and Jackson and I have stayed in touch since, since I was there and since the book came out. Um, and we talked recently and he said, I don't know, I'm really, you know, I said, how do you know, did you get the copy of the book and everything? And he said, I'm happy. I'm happy. The book is out. I'm happy that you're sharing our story with everybody, but it's happened before people came like Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Came and the UN rapporteur came and like things haven't changed for us. So I just, he's, he feels like there's a sort of like bittersweetness around, I'm one more person who went to that community who wanted to try to tell the story, you know? Um, I hope, as you say, um, this is somewhat different because it's a literary book and it includes the impact of the personal impact of my family and like us as immigrants and what our hopes were. Like there may be a way in which like the honey and the vinegar situation where maybe people will encounter and really understand this story. And I've tried, I tried as hard as I could to draw these people, like show them. And that was your insistence too. That was one of the things that you kept coming back to me about in the editorial process was like, you have to make these people real. You have to show us what they look like. You have to show us, you have to make us care about them. Like, what are those details? You know, there is this, there is, so chief, the chief, chief Kathy Merrick and I have a conversation at the end and she's driving me to her house. But what happened was we had to stop at the grocery store on the way because she had to pick up groceries. And then there was this display of teapots at the grocery store. And she stopped and she wanted to look at the teapots. When I first wrote the book, I didn't have any of that in there because it was just like the meat is what our conversation was about. And it was your insistence that you said these people have to be you have to show us who they are. And I thought the teapots, that's who she is. And we had this, we did, we had this long conversation about teapots and how much she loves collecting teapots and she has them in her house, like rows of them and stuff. And so I thought, okay, we put this in the book too. She's the chief of this nation and she also happens to be a grandmother and she collects teapots. And so we, all of that went into the book in a way I hadn't actually prepared for that. Mm -hmm. So, um, I've lost, I don't even know what your question was anymore. <laughs> well, you, you've answered it. The, that, I mean, I want to follow up though quickly. Have you, you mentioned keeping in touch with Jackson Osborne. Have you kept in touch with others in the community there? Yes, yeah, I have. I've, I've stayed in touch with Jackson. I'm, I've stayed in touch with Anna McKay, the principal of the school, the Mikasu school where the kids died. Mm -hmm. And I've been in touch with Kathy Osborne. Uh, Kathy, who's Kathy Osborne? Is that someone mm -hmm. that I know? I've been in touch with Kathy, Kathy. Is Kathy Osborne a person? Is that a writer? Kathy Miswagen, right? Uh, I think Kathy yeah. is a writer, yes. Kathy yes. Merrick is the name of the chief. I just thought of the name Kathy Osborne came to me. Kathy Merrick. I've stayed in touch with Kathy Merrick. She's not the chief anymore. Um, she did not, she ran for re-election. She did not win her re-election. 
um, we can talk about that too. It's a very, very vibrant, politically vibrant community mm -hmm. um, with yeah, lots of different- just, let, let me interject there actually quickly. Yeah. Because yeah. I, one of the scenes I was most struck by was your attendance at that kind of advisory council that you get brought into. I was very struck by the um, vibrancy of kind of the democratic process there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, it was it was really unlike almost anything I've ever experienced directly. Uh, yeah, it's a small community. It's not that small. It's about six, 7,000, something like that people. Um, but it functions as a direct democracy. They have governing councils. They have tr there's four traditional governing councils and they work in a really interesting way. But everything that gets, every legislation that gets passed through the council is only a proposal for direct referendum. Mm -hmm. And every single thing goes to direct referendum there. Every legislation, every, any law, anything, it goes to direct referendum. And there's community meetings and people come and they're very raucous and everyone's super educated. I mean, this community meeting that you're talking about was a um, community meeting about a Canadian public health law that pertained to um, who pays for hospital care for Indigenous mm -hmm. children. And the legislation is called Jordan's Principle. And it was about, so it's a very, I don't want to say obscure, it's important and essential, but very particular, um, esoteric, that's the word I'm looking for, a very particular esoteric piece of legislation. Mm -hmm. Vital because it's about, chi you know, ch children's health care. But specific. Mm -hmm. And this meeting, there were probably 30, 40 people there. And people were like, they knew the legislation, they knew the implications of it, they knew what went wrong. They knew why it was proposed. I mean, they, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It was a very, very intense conversation. And so when I went back, the book describes my first visit. Mm -hmm. I've been back since then. Mm -hmm. And once and I was planning on going again, but COVID interrupted. So um, but, uh, you know, when I went back and I found out that Kathy Merrick wasn't the chief anymore, there was another community meeting that I went to and there was a couple people there and I said, what, you know, so what happened, you know, she was so, um, she was so effective, you know, and I thought like, I don't understand, you know, and they said, and people have different opinions here and people are really, really like, educated and they argue all the time and the terms are only two years and they're constantly electing new chiefs if they feel like, that person did something that, that they've had a different view on it, you know? And so Kathy was very savvy with the federal governance and dealing with the province and all of that. And there were people who felt like she should be more locally focused. Mm -hmm. She was out of the community a lot. She was going down to Winnipeg all the time to meet with the parliament and like try to get money. I think she, you know, my humble opinion, I didn't share it with anybody when I was there because none of my business, right? But I thought she was kind of amazing. She was really heroic to me. Um, but people wanted a different kind of, they needed, they wanted someone who was gonna be in Cross Lake more, who was gonna play more of a, a parental kind of what, look after the spiritual needs of the community and like that sort of thing. And that's who they elected next. They elected uh, an, old, an older gentleman, he's also mentioned in the book, an older gentleman by the name of Tommy Monias, who is a long, long time activist and uh, member of the community. And so he became the next chief, but he is also no longer chief. There's a new chief now. So uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, people are real spitfires in a way that I wish, like Americans, act that way but they don't necessarily always have the knowledge base you know there's all these like weird conspiracy theories and like stuff that doesn't have a basis in reality instead of like really reasoned educated public debate and that's what you saw there mm -hmm. yeah, yeah i was very struck by that the um do you know um has covid been a significant factor up there yeah they they did the community lockdown early they locked down before anybody else did, um, but they were did, they were still impacted. Um, you know, a lot of their, you know, Canadian colonialism really, really interrupted people's traditional way of life, and so did the dam. And so, whereas people before would raise their food, shoot their food with arrows. Um, or, or bullets, but um, they would do, you know, they lived very sustainably in a sense because they were hunting, fishing, trapping, skinning, um, 
and uh, growing, you know, things. It's very different now, you know. Um, the Indian Act that governed, you know, Indigenous Canadian life for 150 years or more, it's still impact, but some of those provisions like prevented people from growing certain things. It would be like, you are not allowed to grow these seven vegetables, but those would be the only seven things that could grow there. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's shifted and changed and people are really dependent now, like probably most American towns too, super dependent on commerce coming in and grocery trucks are coming up from Winnipeg. When I was there, I went to the grocery store and uh, I saw blueberries in the produce section and on the, the label on the blueberries said Watsonville, California. So they're eating the same blueberries in the far north of Manitoba uh, as I am in California. And as I did in Ohio, you know, so COVID automatically came into the community and they, they were first, you know, the indigenous communities were first to get the vaccine, but a lot of people, there's a lot of, as there is here, there's, there was suspicion about the vaccine and people who maybe did and didn't want to take it. There's a really brutal history between the Canadian medical <laughs> profession and indigenous people. And so their people are skeptical, like what's gonna happen, you know? So it's ongoing there. Um, there was a recent spike of cases, but they are trying to stay as, I mean, they're already an isolated community, but they're also now trying to, it's difficult because as I describe in the book, there are many communal living situations where there are 14, 15 people living in single family home. Mm -hmm. And if like one person brings a virus into that environment, everybody will get it, you know? So it's a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, it's a challenge, but the latest information that I had was like not too current. I talked to Jackson a, a bunch of weeks ago, maybe not quite a month ago. And at that time, there were some new cases that were coming in. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure what's happening right now. So I want to circle back to something we touched on earlier, but it's, it strikes me as a really important point. Um, if you had your druthers, what kind of impact would you like to see come from this book? What are your hope? What are your your greatest hopes? I think that the Canadian government has always um, played a certain kind of lip service to um, having a nation to nation relationship with First Nations communities and seeking um, input from Indigenous communities about any you know infrastructural um, change that would impact them, but that has not always borne itself out in reality. So for example, with the, with the Bennett Dam in BC that indigenous communities are protesting or the pipeline, um, the big, big major pipeline that's gonna go, in, go, go into Minnesota actually. Um, I talk about it in the book. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at, I I'm flipping through the book to look at the epilogue. Uh, it's called line three a new double capacity pipeline that will run from the oil fields of Alberta to Lake Superior. And all of the indigenous communities, every indigenous community that this pipeline is gonna pass through has protested its building, but its construction is going ahead. The only reason it hasn't started yet is that the state of Minnesota, as of this writing, I don't know the updated, but as of the writing of that, that which was I think November of 20 is when we finalized it for, for sure. Um, the state of Minnesota has not yet approved. Mm -hmm. So it's yet held up. And so that really speaks to the fact that, and you know, the, pro the problem for the government of Canada, not for the people, the problem for the government of Canada is that all those Northern First Nations communities, there's hydroelectric potential, there's fresh water, there's minerals and mining. You know, the Canadian GDP, if you look at the, like the, say the top 10 sources of the Canadian GDP, like very high up on that list, I don't know the exact, but you can look this up, very high up on that list is mining and, and minerals and, and, and natural gas. Um, extraction. Oil, extraction, extraction. And all of that is on the Northern land mm -hmm. and indigenous land. So moving forward, these questions, even though this dam was built in 19, you know, between 1976 and 1979, when they finished it, these questions are gonna come again and again and again. And every time they discover some new thing, don't tell me, don't sell me a bridge and tell me that if there's some Northern indigenous community of seven, 8,000 people that's on top of what suddenly is discovered to be like a titanium deposit or oil fields, 
that the government is not going to do eminent domain or whatever it is. I don't know what the term is in Canadian legal structure. So these, the question of like who's right to, who has the right to the land is absolutely 100% going to come back. So you've, you've been talking a lot about the situation in Canada. Could you talk a little bit about parallels in the US and, um, and, and, and surely this desired impact you're describing would would cross the border. I mean, this is a North American situation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I hope so. I hope it does. I mean, of course, the pipelines, um, the conversation about the various pipelines, um, the conversation about mineral extraction on Indigenous land and national park and protected areas, um, you know, is, you know, always comes. Mm -hmm. So I think that, um, I, I think that I hope that it does have an impact. The story that I had to tell was the story of this, you know, Canadian First Nation. Um, but I think it is absolutely applicable. I live in San Diego now, which is Kumeyaay land, the traditional lands of the Kumeyaay people. And their protests are around the border wall mm -hmm. because the national border of the United States and Mexico lies on traditional Kumeyaay land. And so their point of view as a community is fine. You have these two countries, you have this border, but don't build anything there. We don't want a wall on top of it. Mark it, patrol it, do what you feel like you have to do, but we don't want a wall there. And so they, there is a wall, there is a wall in certain places, right? As you, as you no, including here in the San Diego Tijuana border, there is an actual wall, but there is large stretches where there isn't one. And so this conflict has been over water flow, um, the animals, so they, you know, build it, they're trying to build it in such a way that the animals can pass through it. Um, but people can pass through it too and, and do. So it's just, uh, you know, and they're, you know, talking about it being built on their, you know, the cultural history of the land. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned in your, uh, land acknowledgement, someone used the phrase time immemorial. It's, but you can find archeological evidence, you know, in the North, in Canada, they had, there was an archeologist from the University of Wisconsin who went up there. Um, and I talk about this in the book and he found archeological evidence going back 12,000 years. I mean, 12,000 years is older than any country on the planet. <laughs> There's not a one that's 12,000 years old, you know? Um, and he found archaeological evidence to show that there was a culturally contiguous presence across the north of Canada. So they were not isolated communities. They did not come over on the land bridge. Um, there was a community. In fact, the archaeological evidence shows a migration from east to west. So it's it's like a renewal. The the uh, archaeologist's name is Will Gilmore. So there's like a renewal of um, an understanding of what that immemorial means. It actually, there is actually, um, you can quantify how many generations and how many thousands upon thousands upon thousands of years these lands have been um, indigenous properties. Mm -hmm. And that the, the settler governments, the United States, Canada and Mexico and others are very, very, very new in terms of like the long timeline of human presence on the land. Mm -hmm. And we owe, there, there is, you know, more, not just morally speaking, morally speaking, fine, agree, agreed. But legally speaking, according, according to the treaties that were written and signed. So I think that is an important issue. I don't know, from my part, I don't know the finest points about what's happening on the American side of the border because I, I haven't immersed myself in that, but um, but I hope, I mean, any person, any writer, any of the people on this call could write a book like this. Um, one could find out what happened in the town I live in, who was here first, what was the history of it. Um, and as I confront my own family, like what my father built and what we profited from, every person can also ask that same question. You know, what did I, what have I helped to build? What, you know, who lost what because of what I helped to build? And what are the ways that I profit from? So I put that at the very end of the acknowledgement section in the book, I put that little sentence um, yeah. that says, yeah, you know, what did I say? Oh, I've, uh, where does your electricity come from? Upon whose land does your home sit? 
I think that would be a good place to start because we flipped the switch. I flipped the switch right over there, but it comes from somewhere and it has an impact. So it might come from a solar panel. In my case, it doesn't, but you know, yeah. But, but um, doing the work and learning and then retelling stories. And really, I was very struck by another, um, I think you cite a historian in the book at one point who makes, he says, you know, Canada's a story. It's constantly being retold and reshaped. So is obviously American history yeah. is a story, which yeah. is in fact, increasingly contested elements of our- Yeah, history. what is America, what is the United States and when does the history start? And all the backlash against the 1619 project, I think is part of that, which is like, how do we tell the American story? Whose voice is included? Whose voice is important? What is America? So that actually brings me, at least I think it brings me to one of the uh, last questions I'd like to ask you, which is, um, you know, still in the context of impact, but not necessarily uh, regarding your desired impact of your book, but rather, you know, I obviously think a lot about the impact of our work as an organization. And um, so I'd like to ask you, you know, as a writer we've published, the author of this book, a, a lot of the attendees, this wasn't really included in your introduction, but um, I know very well that in, in the literary world, Kazim is also known as a publisher and so it was the um, founder, the co-founder of one of the more prominent literary presses in America and is a really active literary citizen. And so with all of, bearing all of that perspective in mind, you said some really nice things about milkweed editions, but how do you think, where could we be having more impact and where from your perspective would you like to see an organization like Milkweed have impact in the world? I think that there is a great opportunity to um, be very conscious about promoting the types of literature that we're talking about. So in the old days, there was that actual series, the Credo series, you know, I think Milkweed has shown over the past, you know, however many years it's been re in recent history, you know, six, five, six years, recent history, the milkweed's shown a real commitment to indigenous writers too. Mm -hmm. And it would be great to sort of formalize that in some way and say, look, we're not just only going to do pick books every now and then, but we're really gonna say there's a list and every year we're gonna do one or more, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but with a list, it also means you actually have to cultivate writers because you have to fill the spots on the list. That's the danger of the list, right? It's like, okay, now we got to find the books. Nothing came in this year. What do we do? But, but good comes of that beyond the books is what you're saying. It's a real commitment. It means that you gotta you gotta look at you gotta cultivate writers. You gotta see who's in the MFA programs, who's writing what. You gotta comb through the magazines and the journals and say like, oh, that's an interesting this person, that person, or get re as you as you do get re references from current uh, you know current. Um, people on the list, uh, people who are part of Milkweed's list already to kind of solicit. So there could be a commitment to indigenous writing. There could be a commitment. Uh, and when I say commitment, I mean formal. Mm -hmm. I don't mean like, yeah, this is just my suggestions. Um, you know, writing that engages social justice, writing that engages, um, you know, some of the conflicts that we're facing now and, you know, in particular in the city that you are in, you know, um, you're at the epicenter in a lot of ways of the, of the sort of new, new, um, gosh, we've been struggling and having these protests like over and over and over again. And every once in a while, there's a flashpoint, mm -hmm. um, like, you know, Trayvon Martin's killing or, and, or Tamir Rice in Cleveland where I lived. Every once in a while, there's a flashpoint, although the, the problem has been ongoing, you know? And I think last summer when George Floyd was killed, the day that the birder was accosted in Central Park, those two stories, you know? And it was this contrast of like, what could have gone wrong for the birder, you know? And then George Floyd, dying you know in the street and i don't know i feel like we we need to integrate this in some way and not think of like maybe it's even against the concept of like a separate consideration of literature that you know treats social justice as opposed to that coming into every part of the conversation you know this the concept of the land acknowledgement being normalized just every time you're somewhere to know what what what, what you 
your ten, your tenants of a land that was owned previous and to really to normalize that to bring it in to make it part of everything so every part of literature should consider the indigenous in fact mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. i'm not sure well and as you know we're we're actively publishing books that are at that conjunction of social justice environmental justice um indigeneity and that which also does reflect our location our place yeah. And um, we're conscious about that. We could always do more, um, but I'd like to think, you know, I mean, I, as I said at the outset, I'm very proud of having published your book and actively publishing it now. And um, I, I feel I was affirmed in my sense as I was rereading the book over the last couple of days that um, the power of this book getting into serious readers' hands is really immeasurable. So I just can't thank you enough. I, I want to make sure I thank you appropriately before we, we get kicked off Zoom. <laughs> I, want, I, want to, uh, I want to also thank all of you for joining us. Um, you get a sense for um, how rich and pleasurable and rewarding working with writers like Kazim Ali is for me. Um, but Kazim, I can't thank you enough for making the time for us this evening and well, for all of the collaboration and just so sending out so much love. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I appreciate everything that you've done and continue to do. And I want to thank everyone, all of you folks who came and, you know, turned out and came out, especially um, the folks who maybe supported this book specifically. I, I thank you, but I thank you on behalf of this community. So it means a lot to me and it means a lot to my father too, frankly, even though we haven't talked fully about it, but um, Laylee Long Soldier and I talked about it and that's also in the book, but she brought up this concept that my journey there was a form of remediation, you know? And so I feel grateful to have had the chance to do that for me and for my family um, and to tell the story and to share the story. And if it has half the impact that you're talking about, Daniel, I'll be so grateful. Um, not not for myself but for for the for the people of cross lake well thanks again thanks for thanks for doing the work and thanks for entrusting us with this publication and i look forward to seeing that manuscript you've picked up too oh yeah i mean it's a mess <laughs> be a you gotta give me a couple months <laughs> all right well you know where to find me i can't promise six minutes next time no, no, it's okay. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I hope you have a great evening. Thanks for making time. I'm sure you're on Zoom all the time. Thank you. Really I've been on Zoom all day. <laughs> really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Good night. Bye.